I want to uh, welcome you to this uh, marvelous country, which is India. Okay, India, it's, uh, it's one of the most beautiful country. And I have to say that is the second country with more population around the world. And the first one is China. And then after China, India is the, the second more populous country in the world. India, in this case, is often referred uh, to, it is almost like a subcontinent, a subcontinent in Asia, and it is only a different and vasting uh, land, so it is a very big country. Uh, some writer, which is Mark Twain, probably you have heard about him, he said that India is the cradle often human uh, race, the birthplace of human speech, the mother of history, the grandmother of legend, and the great grandmother of tradition. India, it's an old country with a lot of tradition, so uh, it is important to learn about it. Some people said that uh, some of the first people who existed started in India. India is the place that uh, gave birth to the first uh, or to the four most known um, religions in Asia. So it is a very, very big area. So India actually is surrounded by the sea on the three sides. So it's a very, it's very important for commerce and trading. In the past, we are going to see that in history it was and it continues being up to now. India is very famous for its ancient history and the landscapes that it has and the diverse of culture. They are different cultures in India. There are up to 22 different languages that people have. There are like eight different religions in that country. So it's a place that uh, definitely is worth to visit. India is, as I said, a diverse country. And uh, um, in this case, it is visible, the difference between the people that lives in that country. Because you can see Muslim people, Muslim people like in uh, Afghanistan, for example, or you can see also people with different religions and traditions around the country. The culture and also the weather is different because the land is very extensive. Um, so it starts actually in the Himalayas and uh, it is uh, moving and cultivated through the peninsula of the far south. So um, in this case, the weather changes from the Himalayas, which is really cold, to uh, in this case to the hot weather that goes very close to the coast. The Indian culture varies like the vast geography. People are speaking different languages, they dress different clothes, they follow different religions, eat different food, but they, are, uh, they all have the same temperament. All people in India are very kind because it's part of their religions, all of them, <laughs> to be kind. So they are usually kind to people who decide to visit that wonderful country. Um, I think that uh, for Indian people, as far as I have read, it is uh, important to be united. So they usually keep families united. And uh, uh, it's very common to see people living in the same house, big whole families with children, great grandchildren, grandchildren, and a lot of people living in the same house. So let's start uh, seeing one of the most or the most important information from this beautiful country. We can say uh, that country, I told you, it's a very large country. It is located in Asia. The official name is the Republic of India. Uh, the capital city is New Delhi. And I was telling you that is the second country most populated in the world. The population is about one three billion dollars, one billion people, sorry, 1.3 billion people living in the same country. Can you imagine in Guatemala, we only have 17 uh, million. They have 1,300 million people living in that country. It's definitely a lot of people, and that's why it's the diversity. They have different religions, as I said, because there are a lot of people living there. The official languages are, are Hindi and English, but they have other 22 languages, which are mainly tribal. 
they come from the different tribes from the country. So Hindi and English are basically the main language. Both are official. That means that English can be found uh, not only uh, for touristic purposes, but also in official communication. If you go to an official office and you need to do some kind of papers, they could be in English. University always teach English in some regions from the country. And uh, Hindi is used as well as English. The nationality in this case is Indian. That's the correct way to call people living there, Indian. And they have uh, different religions. In this case, the main ones are Hinduism. Hinduism uh, has probably the 72% from all the people. Then Islam is also uh, very popular. It is the second one, maybe with the 17%. Christianity, not so much, maybe like the 8%. Siskin, Buddhism, and Jainism, which are uh, religions that were created, that were born uh, in India, they had uh, less people. So maybe like about the 5% uh, with the three different, uh, the three different uh, religions. The currency from India is the Indian rupee. Indian rupee, that's the, the, the kind of money that they use. Dollars in this case are not used. Pounds like in, um, in UK, they are not used. Indian rupee is the currency that they have. Probably you have heard that in India, in India English is spoken, but do you know why is English the second language? I mean, India is in Asia, so what about English? Uh, English, uh, in this case, India was a British colony for almost 100 years. So that's why they assume the English language. As I told you because uh, before, because of the position of India in the globe, you see they have uh, seas over all around. So uh, about the 1600 years, uh, this part or this land was very famous because of commerce. People from Asia, people from Europe use this as a port to send and to receive product from different continents. So India was like an, a strategical point for commerce. And a lot of, a lot of countries tried in this case to conquer India because it was very important. So um, the United Kingdom, the UK, decided to start a trade. A trade is when you agree to do something together. So um, in this case, the British, uh, the British government or the Queen decided to start having some kind of conversation to Indian government to start facilitating the sending of the products that they were selling. So they started a trade. A trade is como un trato. And they decided to start sharing then um, different types of woods or products sent from India to the UK. And um, basically the UK started having like uh, some kind of uh, political and also military bases in the country. Finally, up to the years of maybe 18, 1858, if I am not wrong, uh, they decided uh, to be part of the UK as an Indian, as a colony. So the United Kingdom assumed the government of India. In that case, the Queen Elizabeth I was the queen uh, in, in the UK. So she became also the queen of uh, India. She was, uh, well, India and, and Great Britain were together like for about 100 years like about 19, 1950, 1948, something like that, they decided to stop the trade and they wanted to become a republic. And that's why now the Indian is, is known as the Indian Republic because they decided to separate from the British government and start having their own, uh, their own government. So English is spoken in India because for about 100 years, they were part of the um, of the Great uh, Britain, so they uh, started like adapting their government to the way that um, the UK did. So now it is very common to see people all over India speaking English as well as speaking Indian. 
I have to say that the part of English is more related to the center of the country where people can afford education because most of education like universities are in English. But in other, in other zones, in other poor zones around uh, India, the main language spoken is Hindi. Okay, so today I want to share to you some uh, video that I found about um, the way that Indian speak in English. The way that they speak is different. They have a very particular accent. Actually, uh, dictionaries recognize Indian English as a different form of English because they had added their own words, their own expressions. So that's why we can uh, find different ways to pronunciate the words. So I am going to show you, okay, I'm gonna show you the video so you can see it. And then we are going to talk about it, okay? Let me share the, the screen. Okay. Okay, let me stop it. Okay, so uh, this is a girl that is talking about how Indians uh, recognize the, his, I mean, their own pronunciation. For them, English is English no matter what the pronunciation is, because it is very common that countries like in United States, for example, or in some other countries from Europe, uh, people usually make fun of their pronunciation of English. Actually, you can find on the internet a lot of funny videos about uh, Indian pronunciation, but this is the way that they have learned to, to speak it. So they basically ask for respect about how to refer to their own uh, pronunciation. So let's listen to it, and then we talk about what, okay? Let's go. Triple summation, boss. Did you know that English is a very widely spoken language? In fact, whenever we do the street interviews, viewers always wonder that why people are answering in English and not in Hindi. So what do Indians think about this? Are they actually aware of how their accent sounds? Let's hit the streets of Mumbai to find out. If you had to take a guess, what percentage of Indian population can speak fluent English? Maybe 40. 40%, 40 maybe. If you're going to any colleges or school, no one speaks English, Hindi at all. It's everything related to English itself. So I think that 70 to 80 percent might know English. English is, I think, far more important than Hindi right now for Indians. So yeah, I think 40 to 45 percent around people speak fluent English. I guess around uh, 75 percent of Indian people can speak English fluently. Hmm. Um, most of them are from South India because they are like uh, they are much more educated than the people living in North India. So. That's my opinion and my I am myself a South Indian, so... By the way, Indian English does have a particular accent. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think it does. It's actually proper English. So it's this not accent, it's it's proper English, simple. Yes, pretty much, but uh, it, it has nothing got any problem with uh, Indian people as such because that is the way we talk. So for you, it is normal, right? Your accent? Yes, it's normal. As an Indian person, were you aware that foreigners often make fun of the Indian English accent? Yeah, it is actually uh, like when um, I have not personally encountered the situation, but my uh, like I have cousins who live in the US, they speak uh, that, uh, you know, US accent of English, but still they get judged like this person looks Indian and, you know, people, I don't know why, it's basically racism and it's just senseless to me basically. Yes, I was, but uh, after I went to the United States, I thought they spoke wrong English, so I made fun of their English, so it doesn't make any difference to me. <laughs> I think our accent is better than theirs, because uh, they, I think they are like, not that good. It looks like they are spitting. Well, I think, uh, sorry, yes. <laughs> sorry, not offensive. It looks like they are spitting, and I think our accent is better, yeah. No, no. I think they need to learn English from us. It is like when we hear them, we find it funny. It's lame. I don't really care what they think. Like, I can speak English and I can, like, you know, make other people understand what I want to say. That's enough. Mm -hmm. I don't really care what they think. Well, Indian characters like Appu from The Simpsons have perpetuated stereotype in Western culture that Indians sound funny when they speak English. How does that make you feel? I don't know. I think it's 
if you watch it, I think it's funny at times, but then it really annoys you a little. Ki like you know, you are stereotyping us a little too much. Mm. You're taking a little too far. Like we don't really sound like that at all times. But okay. That is funny to you guys, to the foreigners, and it's not funny to anybody in India because that is the way we talk. So and people understand. That's the main thing. Sometimes I feel offended, but the they exaggerated more. I think, you know, we don't speak like that. Firstly, uh, but yeah, I feel offended sometimes. Very offended, to be honest. I mean, it's funny for some time, and like, dude, no, we do not speak like that. Stop doing that. Then to you, which English accent sounds funny or weird? Oh, I think the way Russians speak. I mean the people, those who have their language as Russian or French. Yeah. They, those are the weirdest English-speaking people around. Seriously. My brother has been in Australia, and his accent is literally funny. <laughs> For me, Australian accent is I really don't understand any of it. Literally any of it. I just don't understand. Not because of the accent, maybe because of the wrong grammatical use. I find Chinese English quite funny because uh, they don't use the proper, you know, grammatical things. Chinese. I must say Chinese. So their language is difficult. That that has when they speak English. Exactly. They even don't uh, pronounce it very well. The the their lips even don't open for that. So why does everybody speak English as opposed to the native Indian languages? In India, I guess speaking English is a trend or maybe a it is like show off or something. I think English. If you know English, you have lots of friends, and uh, well, you're cool. You're the cool guy. I'll say parents. That's it. Because they want the kids to speak English so that. Yeah. When they go to the school, they don't feel ashamed. Is that how every child is taught from an early young age? I cannot say about other childs, but when my father he insisted at my home I should speak my own native language, and he pays good fees for my school, so it's school's responsibility to teach me English. So I don't know how does everyone works, but that's how I was brought up. Some people feel, not actually most of the people people feel. That when they are educated in English, they will have higher job opportunities, and then they th dream about going to our other countries for jobs. Yeah. And that's the basic reason for them learning English. Otherwise, they would not even be interested in knowing the language. If you speak fluent English, do people treat you better? Yeah, in India, yes. I I, I have seen that. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, when you just come across someone, you have a sort of mindset towards them. As soon as they start speaking, your mindset changes. Like, okay, they can speak English. Yeah, okay, they must be like cool, I guess. And if you're talking before a girl, she is going to be impressed by you. That's the most important thing about talking yeah. English. When you start talking in English, and especially when you're talking really fluently, yeah, they they'll just they give you much more respect than they usually give to other people who are talking in other languages. Because English is becoming such a dominant language in Indian society, are you ever concerned that traditional Indian languages might disappear? Yes, it is going on right now. I think even academically, uh, today's generation is taught to speak in English and write English. Yes, I am afraid of that thing right now because hmm. we, being the youth of India, we shall take care of this thing that we should not forget our own native language. If this continues, perhaps it, that day is not far that this this will be our national language. Uh, no, I'm not quite concerned about it because uh, we often have many uh, organizations and cultural committees who focus on other languages. So I don't think it is dying out because there are many people who support it and they want our traditional languages to last forever. Yeah, I'm I'm bit concerned because, as I said before, it is like when a child is born, they are taught English first and then the mother tongue. So this is not at all a good thing for me. Like even now we yeah. are speaking about English, we're not discussing any other language here. So that's that itself shows how we give English more importance than any other languages. So if it did disappear, the regional languages, what would that mean for the next generation of Indians growing up? Well, it would be really bad. I think people from other countries come to India to see the culture and everything and we might just lose it on the way. 
So I just hope we don't really, you know. But I don't think it would really go anywhere. We'll continue speaking Hindi, Marathi, and everything. Learn to speak language. Language is really important. But do not forget, you come from society or group of people or a different community. Do not forget that. Yeah. Do not forget your roots. Well, there you have it, guys. Is English becoming dominant language in your country, and how is it affecting your community? Be sure to subscribe to Asian Boss for more authentic insight. Okay. So now, what do you think about Indian English? Is it very different from the English that you have heard? What do you think? Give me your opinion, yes. guys. Yes, the sounds of the English, the words. What did you find? Uh, what did you find more uh, different from the English that we speak in this video? I think they talked a little bit like um, with a different accent and sounds like they are is, is speak a other language. Mm -hmm. Yes, actually, uh, Indian English is considered a different English because they um, they use their own words or they incorporate their own words in the language. So it's not only the difference in the pronunciation, but also the difference in the um, in the way to communicate ideas because they use different words. I have another video, it's a short one. It, it explains some of the differences about um, a, the Indian accent and the British accent. Remember that the both cultures were together. So we're going to look at quickly and then uh, we're going to see exactly what was or what is the difference that we find in this. This is an example because there are actually a lot of differences related to the pronunciation, but let's go to it. Okay, let me open it. <laughs> Hello, my name is Anbu and welcome to uh, my YouTube channel. Um, uh, today I wanted to, uh, you know, introduce the uh, Indian accent to you. Um, I am very well aware that there is a, 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 a big variety of uh, Indian accents uh, and not just Indian, there is Sri Lankan, Pakistani and uh, you know, all over South Asia, there is different accent, but I want to introduce to you the South Indian accent. You know, I am very uh, interested in accents and I, um, you know, if you're ever interested in learning the Indian accent, um, perhaps you have a, you know, an acting role where you have to learn Indian accent. This video will cover the basics of the Indian accent. Uh, so without further ado, let's get straight into this video. Please mind again between the train and the platform. Let's just address the elephant in the room. You were clearly judging me on my Indian accent, weren't you? <laughs> you know, I'm also passionate about like, you know, identity and racism, uh, but that is not the topic of today's discussion. Today's discussion is about the Indian accent and if you follow a, a few simple steps and a few simple rules, uh, you'll be able to master the Indian accent, you know, really easily. Let's start off with the T sound. So the T is, sounds something like this. T. T. Not T. T. So your tongue is actually further back in your mouth. So for example, if you want to say the word but, in the Indian accent it's but. But. Okay? So not but, but. So let's try dot. It's not dot, it's dot. Okay, so I'm really exaggerating the T here. So try and practice that sound. Yeah, and uh, you then tone it down a little bit. So, dot. Yeah, it, 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 it. So in the sentence, don't try it becomes don't try it. Don't try it. So once you've practiced that, the next sound to practice is the L sound. So let's take the word table, for example. When we say the word table, we don't actually pronounce the L in table. You've got the T sound, which we talked about earlier, 
and this L sound. So practice the start, not T, T, and then it becomes table, table, not table, table. So can you put the uh, you know groceries on the table, please? The next sound is the W sound. So British people will pronounce W as W. And so the word water turns into water. Okay, so the W turns into a V. And then the T in water is the sound that we practiced earlier. And then the R is what the last sound is what we're going to practice. So R isn't R, it's R. So, water, water. Another word could be pizza, Peter, Peter. I spoke to uh, Peter on the phone. I spoke to Peter on the phone. All right, so I'm, I'm sure you can hear that difference there. And I've tried to break down the particular sounds that sound different. So go away and practice that. And you know, I might do a part two. Uh, so hit like on this video if you found that video useful. And you know, this, this video is not intended to make fun out of any accent. It, you know, it's purely educational. And you know, this video is all about if you are wondering what an Indian accent sounds like and how exactly to do one. I hope this video helped. Subscribe to my channel to stay. <laughs> okay, so now you can see some differences. There are more letters that are pronounced different and different and uh, well it's interesting how how people speak english around the world sometimes i think that people feel ashamed about speaking english when you don't make the correct pronunciation of the word but actually in different countries there are people who speak english in different ways and this one is one of it but in this case it's more cultural because the they have to assume the english language as a, a new language for them. So they use the language that they learn, and they put some of their own culture into that language. And that's now this is the result of that combination of cultures. So now you know, if you want to travel to India, you can travel without any trouble because they speak English almost in the most popular cities. So then let's talk a little about what places can we visit in India? There are some places that are very popular and the most common visited by tourists. So let's go to them. Okay, uh, the first place is the Mysore Palace. The Mysore Palace is very popular in India. It is like really, really big. And uh, this Mysore Palace once was the residence of the Wadayars. Water years um, was one of the like uh, most traditional um, royal families in India. So it's one of the largest palaces in India and is one of the most splendid. The kind of materials that they used to build this palace were uh, really expensive. At night, this palace is enlightened, so you can visit it also at night and find, um, well, marvelous about the size and the beautiful structure and beautiful architectural form from the, from the palace. In this case, they use a lot of arts. I think that this palace seems to be like a kind of Muslim. So they include a lot of uh, different um, uh, arts in the design, like in the Muslim uh, um, architecture they do. They have this, which is called the Golden Royal Elephant Throne. This, uh, this throne is all made of gold, and it is uh, used for the king to be seated on it. Actually, it, is, uh, it, it can be visited in some festivals in India, and uh, uh, in some cases, you can see like uh, the royal family from the, re from the region, is sitting on that throne. So it exists, it is decorated with sapphires and diamonds. Can you imagine how expensive it is? <laughs> so people always protect it. Something interesting about some palaces in India is that if people visit them, they have to wear some kind of protection uh, in their shoes. So they avoid uh, the palace to be a scratch, you know, by the dirt or any stones that you carry on your shoes. So uh, this is a beautiful place to visit. And as you see, um, 
a lot of parts from the from the palace are covered with real gold. So um, this is probably the wealthiest um, palace in India, and that's why it is visited all over the all over the year. Thousands of visitors came there. Uh, the entrance of this is about uh, 10 rupees for the for locals. And if you are not from India, then you have to pay about 1,000 rupees. So it's a big difference between one or the other. That in dollars could be uh, maybe like $20 to get into the, into the palace. But I think it's worth it. I mean, the money that you're paying to watch it is great. Then we have Amritsar. Amritsar. This is a temple, also golden. I think India love golden colors. <laughs> so this is a golden temple and it is visited uh, for a lot of people during the year because uh, of the design. The, the golden temple is located in a holy city, in the holy city or uh, six. Um, this city is very populated and this temple that you see is actually placed in the middle of the palace. You can see it, it's in the water, the palace is around, and the temple is in the middle of the palace, like this. The palace is all over around, and this is the temple, the entrance. And you see how many people came to visit the, the palace every day. It is probably one of the most uh, visit, uh, visited temples in India, because it is um, like, uh, it is a place where people go to, uh, to, how to say it, to purify, if, uh, to purify from sins. So this is a place that people visit for purification. And that's why it is surrounded by water. Water for Indian people represents a uh, purification. That's why it is in the center of the, of the palace. So uh, actually uh, in some days, more than 100,000 people visited the temple in only one day, okay? Another interesting place to visit is the, I have a problem with this, Bradavisvara Temple. <laughs> Bradavisvara Temple, <laughs> a long word. Okay, Bradavisvara Temple is ancient. The, the temples that we that we seen before, uh, were related to the more modern culture of India. But this one was before, before that. In this case, uh, the Radhavisvara temple, it's very ancient, it is uh, very uh, splendid, and their architecture, uh, actually it was considered built in the year 985, not even a thousand, 985 after Christ. So, uh, they have a lot of different structures, different sculptures put it in the walls. And uh, uh, it's incredible to see how they sculpt all these figures around the temple. Um, it is not available for people to get in. You can only watch it outside because uh, of the age of the temple. The temple is about 2000 years or less than 2000 years. So it's uh, for them is very important to take care of it. So the visits are restricted and uh, you can visit the temple only outside, but not in. These are some of the sculptures that you can see, sculptures that were made handmade in this case. So imagine how much time it took to build the whole temple, how much time it would take to build all this and sculpt all around the temple. It was more like a uh, hundred years, actually. So this is one of the most popular temples in uh, India. The other uh, temple probably you know about it is the city of Agra and the Taj Mahal. The most popular monument or the most popular um, in this case, in this case, mausoleum is the Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal, um, is an uh, iconic part of India. This is the Agra fort. Agra is the city in which the Taj Mahal was built. Agra, uh, it is also known as the Red Fort because it was all constructed in this red uh, stone. And uh, it is protecting actually the city of Agra and definitely the Taj Mahal. So this is the famous Taj Mahal 
Probably you have seen it. Definitely you have seen it before. This has been an inspiration for uh, many movies, including animated movies. Like probably you have seen a temple similar to this in the movie of uh, Aladdin. And also uh, people use a lot of this iconical, this iconical uh, monument, which actually is considered one of the seventh wonders uh, from the modern world. So um, this temple took a lot of time to be built. And actually there is a love story between the, the construct of this temple. So I want you to join me in a video so we can see the story of Taj Mahal. And then we are going to, to talk about what do you think about it? What do you think about this love story? And uh, let me share the video to you. Okay, give me a second. Okay. Oh my God, I'm advertisements. ¿Cuándo fue la última vez que conectaste? Then there it is. Okay, so this video is about you are watching the, story, place. the story of... Relaxers and welcome back. Okay, this is the story of uh, the Taj Mahal then. And uh, pay attention to it and then we're going to talk about it. English poet Sir Edwin Arnold once described the Taj Mahal as not a piece of architecture as other buildings are, but the proud passion of an emperor's love wrought in living stones. It's true that the Taj Mahal was built as an expression of love, but it also is a profound expression of grief, and today it stands as a symbol of a great love story that ended far too soon. By the end of this video, you'll not only be able to recognize the Taj Mahal as the world-renowned landmark, but also have a better understanding of the story behind it and what it represents. Today we are telling you the story of how the Taj Mahal, the most beautiful building in the world, came to be. But first, a little background. Introduction Taj Mahal means crown of the palace in Persian, and this structure is known worldwide for its distinctive design and unmatched beauty. This white marble mausoleum is found in the Indian city of Agra on the south bank of the Yamuna River. It's the most popular attraction in India, with about 8 million visitors each year. In 1983, it was named as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it's been called the jewel of Muslim art in India. The Taj Mahal is universally recognized as one of the greatest examples of architecture worldwide, and it's a lasting symbol of India's rich history. But the story of how this great structure came to be actually starts about 40 years before the first stone was put in place. So let's go back to the beginning. Love at First Sight Shah Jahan was born as Prince Karam in 1592. Even before his birth, a prophet foretold he would be destined for imperial greatness. Although he was the third son of his father, Emperor Jahangir, from an early age he was expected to one day become emperor. One day when Karam was 14 years old, he was walking in the market when he spotted a beautiful girl selling glass beads and silk. Karam was immediately drawn to her. He went to speak with her and for him it was love at first sight. She was a 15-year-old Persian princess named Arjamand Begum. When Karam got back home, he went straight to his father and told him he found the girl he wanted to marry. They quickly got engaged, but didn't marry until five years later in 1612. The date of the wedding was set by court astrologers, who determined it was the ideal date to ensure a happy marriage. And it was indeed a happy marriage for many years, until tragedy struck. Rise to Power and Heartbreak Arjamand was actually Prince Karam's second wife. He had married Kandahari Begum in an arranged marriage three years earlier and had his first child with her. He married eight other wives after Arjamand, but these marriages were more political, while his marriage to Mumtaz was based on genuine affection and love. 
Karam became the emperor of the Mughal Empire on the Indian subcontinent in 1628, and from then on, he was known as Shah Jahan, meaning the king of the world. He gave Arjumand the title of Mumtaz Mahal, which is Persian for the chosen one of the palace. She became his trusted advisor and accompanied him everywhere. She was certainly his favorite of all his wives. However, in 1631, Mumtaz Mahal tragically passed away while giving birth to their 14th child at the age of 37. After her death, Jahan was described as being heartbroken and paralyzed by grief. Just before Mumtaz died, Shah Jahan made her two promises, that he would never remarry and he would build a mausoleum worthy of her over her grave. And after a while of mourning, he set out to do just that. Constructing the Taj Mahal Shah Jahan soon commissioned the Taj Mahal and construction began just months after Mumtaz's death. The site for the mausoleum was chosen, and Shah Jahan gave the owner of the land a large palace in the center of Agra in exchange for it. Over 22,000 artisans, laborers, stonecutters, and artists were tasked with the construction under the direction of a board of architects, led by the court architect to the emperor, Ahmad Lahauri. The land was cleared and leveled, and wells were dug and filled with stone to help form the foundation of the tomb. A ramp measuring over a mile long was built to facilitate the transport of materials to the site. The marble blocks were put in place through the use of a complex pulley system. The Taj Mahal was built almost entirely out of white marble, and experts believe that over 1,000 elephants were used to transport materials from all over Asia and India to be used in the construction. Teams of 20 or 30 oxen would also be used to transport the marble blocks to the site on customized wagons. In addition to the white marble, the primary materials used were jasper from Punjab, jade and crystal from China, turquoise from Tibet, lapis lazuli from Afghanistan, and sapphires from Sri Lanka. A total of 28 different types of precious stones were inlaid in the white marble, and Shah Jahan chose these materials personally. The tomb of Mumtaz Mahal is the centerpiece of the structure with a distinctive marble dome on top. The highest point of the dome of the tomb stands 240 feet tall. There are also several other buildings on the 42-acre complex, including a mosque and smaller tombs for Shah Jahan's other wives and a larger tomb for Mumtaz's favorite servant. In addition, there's a large square garden and a long rectangular reflecting pool on the grounds. After construction. The construction of the tomb was completed after about 12 years in 1643, but gardens and additional elements were added over the next 10 years. When Shah Jahan died in 1666, his son had him buried next to his wife in the Taj Mahal. The caskets for Mumtaz Mahal and Shah Jahan are displayed in the mausoleum, although they are actually buried on a lower level in the tomb. In the 1700s, Agra was invaded by the Jat dynasty and the Taj Mahal was attacked. The invaders stole two chandeliers that were hanging above the main tomb, and they took other silver and gold decorations. During the Indian Rebellion of 1857, British soldiers chiseled out precious stones from its walls. When India was under British rule, a restoration project was undertaken to restore its beauty. This was completed in 1908, and there haven't been any other major changes to the structure since. The total estimated cost of the original construction was 32 million rupees, which equals out to about 827 million US dollars at today's valuation. This is enough to earn a spot on our list of the 15 most expensive man-made attractions in the world. To find out what else made the list, just click on the top right corner. Okay, guys, so this is the story about how uh, the, Tachma, the Taj Mahal was built and uh, uh, the love story behind it, right? So um, what can you tell me about the love story? What did you heard about it? What, uh, what is this monument? Is it, a, is it a palace or what is it? Give me your opinion, guys. What did you heard about the about the video? 
who was this story of love about and what is this monument is it a palace because it seems to be a palace but what is it actually it's a grave it's okay yes yeah. when when she died he uh, wants to yeah, interact very very her, bury her. Mm -hmm. bury her in that in that place and then mm -hmm. he built that yeah, that construction yes so basically this is the most beautiful tomb that you are going to see and it is based in pure love the story said that um uh, Montas was the favorite wife and uh, in this case Shaj Shayahan, Shayahan <laughs> I made that name uh, was the the like in that moment like the king of the world he had like the entire earth uh, and the entire land and he could decide about how much money he was going to spend so actually he offered her to build a, a mausoleum like this and after she died he decided to build it um they were married for a long time and he had actually 10 wives imagine that 10 wives and for from the 10 wives she was the favorite <laughs> and she got this as a gift after that and she died while uh, while she was giving a birth to the 14th child imagine that 14th uh, so that's why he decided to build this monumental structure as a gift of love. I think that probably it is a gift of love, but it's also a gift of sadness. Imagine how sad he was that he decided to build something as beautiful as this to everyone remember her. So I think it's also uh, like a, a proof of how much he loved her, but also how much he was suffering for her. So it's a very beautiful place to visit. I think that uh, probably is one of the uh, landmarks, it's called a landmark is a monument or something that makes a place characteristic. Okay, like in Paris, there is the Eiffel Tower. In India, it's the Taj Mahal. In New York, you can find the Statue of Liberty. That's what we call landmarks. Okay, but we talk about some monuments that are popular, but there are also some beaches that are popular. India uh, has a long, uh, a long uh, land, uh, a long part of their land covered by beaches and also uh, as uh, water. So um, it is common to find also beautiful beaches to visit in India. A lot of people visit them. They are they have white sand and they are like uh, very relaxing places. Beaches are very expensive places to visit in India. That's why not all the people visit them. But because the, the cost of the hotels are very uh, expensive. So you if you want to stay, for example, a night in a hotel, it would be in some cases more than $1,000 a night. So that makes it too expensive that maybe no some people can't afford it. The cheapest would be that. So. Uh, beaches are also well known in India, but not visited because of the price. <laughs> okay, there are other interesting facts about India that you should know. Probably you have heard about them, but we're going to talk about them now. Okay, have you ever heard about Bollywood? Yes. No? Yes. 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 I have. What have you heard about Bollywood, Hugo? I've heard about it was uh, like a Hollywood industry, but mm -hmm. in from India. Yes, actually the, the word Bollywood is a combination between Hollywood that we know in the United States and Bombay. Bombay, which is one of the richest city in, in India. So that is why, that's why it is called Bollywood. <laughs> in Bollywood, they produce thousands of movies every year. So there are a lot of actors and actresses that became famous and uh, they produce more movies than even uh, Hollywood that you know. <laughs> I, uh, I read that uh, Hollywood produces like a, between one, uh, 1,500 to 2,000 movies every year. And the characteristic of these uh, movies is that they uh, there are a lot of choreographies on them. So uh, usually people express their feelings using choreographies, dancing choreographies in it. 
okay? The choreographies are, um, are really big. A lot of artists participate in them. So that is uh, the main characteristic of this Bollywood. Have you ever, have you ever seen uh, an Indian movie? I have seen that now are very popular in some streaming like uh, Netflix and also in Amazon Prime Video. I have seen that it's easier to find Indian movies. Have you seen them? Never? Some, some of these movies. Ah, I like the um, Air, Stars in Earth, I think is the name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of movies. Mm -hmm. Yes, there, there are a lot of movies from, uh, from Indian actors. It has become more popular, especially now because of the streaming and the internet, you know, the industry has grown. And there are a lot of uh, Indian artists that now are starting participating in some uh, Hollywood movies as well because they become famous uh, with the um, with the Indian movie so now they are part also of the Hollywood universe the um, the characteristical part of these movies or most of them is that they include these beautiful choreographies usually at the end or in some specific places for the movie when they express uh, like uh, feelings I read that uh, because in India, it is not very allowed to express some, some feelings. Then they use the dances, the music, the movements uh, to let the, act, the characters, in this case, uh, to express what they, what they feel or what the character is feeling in that, um, in that moment. So I think that Bollywood is something, it's an industry that is growing. We know that right now um, India is going through a very difficult situation with COVID-19. I think it's due to the amount of population it has and also uh, the fact that people live in one house, for example, an entire family lives. So when I mean an entire family, it means children, grandchildren, grandparents, the parents. So it's about like 20 to 25 people living in one house. So that is being affected a lot uh, with COVID-19. So Bollywood has stopped in this, in this moment. They are not producing movies by now, but we expect that in the future we could see them coming back with more, with more movies and, uh, and uh, with these stories that are very different because they show a lot of their cultural uh, diversity. So watching a, a, an Indian movie is not the same than watching um, a common movie from, from Hollywood, okay? I want you to show just like a small, small, I want to show you a small piece of choreography of some movie that was uh, famous. So you can see it there. Okay, let me share.
Okay, this seems to be a traditional dance, but actually it is not. This is only a choreography made for the movie. So traditional dances are not like these choreographies. We're going to see them later. So you're going to see that there is a difference. This was a choreography made for a movie, not a traditional dance. It seems to be, but it's not. <laughs> okay, so Bollywood is uh, probably, um, well, the Bollywood is the more no, the most known from all of them because but there exist a lot of different uh, types of uh, Hollywood in India. Bollywood is called because this one is the one that comes from Bombay, but actually there are other types of uh, Hollywood as well, and the name changing depending on the place that they are um, produced. So Bom Bollywood is only movies from Bombay, okay? So let's talk about another interesting fact about. If you remember when I show you the choreography, the choreography started with a gesture. What is a gesture? It's a way to, to say hi with your body. And it started with the namaste. Namaste is the common way to say hello or goodbye in, in Indian. It is actually in Hindi. Uh, this has become very popular. So it is a way to show respect. This gesture is used to welcome guests or relatives or people that you don't even know. <laughs> it is a farewell and also a greeting. So it can be used in both ways. The gesture is used to express honor, courtesy, politeness, hospitality, and gratitude to other person. Apart from being used as a greeting, it is also used as a, with a religious purpose to worship in temples. Worship means adorar in temples. So uh, in other religious, um, in all, some of the religious from, uh, from India, it is used to. Uh, in this case, when it comes to the religious part, the namaste uh, greeting means uh, the greeting to God. Like it's like saying hi to God. Um, uh, namaste can be used like in everyday kind of conversation of language. And in this case, um, you can see this, uh, this gesture in many different places all around India. Um, in everyday re uh, religious rituals, it is used as well. And also in yoga, yoga postures, probably you have seen it from there. So um, in this case, uh, if you practice this gesture in India, it will help you to, to create a relation with people in India, in India because it's like, a, it's like the way to speak their language without using your mouth. When you use the namaste, uh, the namaste uh, greeting, it's like if you are telling them in their own language what you wish for them. So um, how to say the, the namaste or what, what does it mean? It is derived from an old language that is called Sanskrit. Sanskrit is a language that Indian think that was the language that the, their gods uh, talk in the in the beginnings of the of the creation of the earth. So Sanskrit is considered um, a sacred language in India. So the word Namaste comes from Sanskrit. The word Namas means bow, which means uh, inclinarse. Or uh, what would be the other? Inclinarse or saludar, like this. And then the other te means to you. Namaste, in this case, is bow to you. Um, when we use the word namaste or how to make the greeting, uh, the, traditional the traditional style is that you have to put your hands together. Your 10 fingers should be touching each other. Your palms should be together. The thumbs have to be very close to your chest. And then you have to bow, uh, to bow slightly. Slightly, not that, un poquito. <laughs> okay, and then you can say the word then, namaste. So uh, it could be considered a, a praying or it could be considered, as I say, as a greeting. But according to the Hindu customs, namaste has a spiritual meaning too. Hindus believe that the divine, uh, I mean, gods and souls are connected uh, in everybody. So my soul can be connected to your soul. So when you say namaste, 
to you, I am saying hello, not only to you, but to your own divine person in you. I am saying hello to your mind and body. That's why they use this greeting. It is like uh, very related uh, to the Hindu or to the, um, to the Indian in general people. So people use it all over India. And if you use it in any place, they would understand that namaste. You are saying hello to their minds. Uh, let's go to the next one. There are different ways to say, use namaste, as I told you, like uh, in the religious part or just in yoga or to say hello and bye. Yoga was also invented in India. A jo the yoga origins, uh, you can uh, trace them to the northern India for about 5,000 years ago. The word of yoga was first mentioned in an ancient sacred text called Rig Veda. The Vedas are a set of four ancient sacred texts uh, written in Sanskrit that I told you were the, the, the language of gods. So uh, imagine how long is, how old yoga is. And obviously it is related to the use of the namaste. Okay, another interesting fact about India is that the game snakes and ladders and also chess, both were invented in India. Have you ever played snakes and ladders? There are more versions of that. Sometimes uh, they, they, they have other names, but the main, uh, the main board game, the, the main board game was created uh, in India hundreds of years ago. Actually, um, they said the historian said that the game was invented uh, originally was used to give moral instruction to children. So when they were going through the game, when they found uh, like uh, traps of the, or temptation, when they go into the temptation or they commit sin, they go back with the snakes. And when they decided to grow and to be different and to be obedient, they go up with the ladders. So originally this game was used to teach children to be good. <laughs> and then chess. Chess was also invented in India. It became popular in, in Europe, but actually it was brought to India. It has uh, it have, uh, had a lot of different changes, but uh, the, history the, the, history, the history of, of chess could be traced back nearly 1,500 years in the past. It started in India, but then uh, the game was uh, took to uh, Persia and they started changing it and then it way, they was part of the European culture. But its origins were traced in India. Okay, something interesting also is that India has the biggest quantity of tigers and lions in the, uh, in the world. India is a vast territory enough to make it uh, or to let the tigers and lions uh, live uh, in freedom. So that's why they have the, the most amount of them, even more than in this case, um, Africa, which we know that they have a lot of them, but no, India actually is working hard to keep them alive. So they have a lot of uh, special areas for them to live and uh, they are helping people to um, stay away from tigers. Long years ago, uh, like 10 years ago, it was very common to hear that tigers were attacking uh, people because people were using uh, the territory of tigers to grow uh, food. So the government decided to move those people to other places where they can farm. And now tigers have their own space as well as lions to survive, okay? So these are some facts that probably you have heard or probably you haven't heard about India. Now, I want to know, do you know anything else that makes India famous? Do you know any other thing that I didn't mention that makes India a popular country? You, you Monica, hi. Yeah, yeah, it's hi. <laughs> I don't understand very well all you talking, <laughs> but I don't uh, hear anything about elephant. Ah, elephants, that's true. Elephants. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's it. 
Okay, very good. Very good. Elephants are important in the in the Indian religion. Actually, there is a god that has the the depiction of an elephant. Elephants are sacred animals. They consider it to be strong and to be the link with, with gods. So that's why they are also sacred. There is another animal that is sacred and I didn't mention, but it is common herd in the literature or probably in some, uh, in some written uh, media. Have you ever heard about what animal, what other animal is sacred in the Indian culture? The monkeys, maybe? The tigers. Mm -hmm. Tigers, uh huh. But yeah. you know, you know what? Have you ever heard the expression "holy cow"? <laughs> "Holy cow" is an American expression, and it is taken from India. In India, the cows are holy. <laughs> the the cows are considered sacred because they provide the different types of food, not necessarily meat. You know that uh, some of the, not all of the population, but part, a big part of the population in India is vegetarian. So they don't eat food. Uh, they don't eat uh, meat, sorry, any kind of meat, but they can eat some um, type of food produced by cows, for example, or eggs that they can eat that. So they are vegetarian and for them, cows are sacred. So you can see anytime you go, you visit India, cows walking on the street and then anyone can touch them. They are, they are sacred, they are protected. So they cannot be touched. Tigers as well, they are considered like sacred animals and uh, that's why they are protecting them and, and letting them like uh, grow again. I read that uh, maybe 20 years ago, there were only about 70 tigers in India. So they were uh, about to get extinct, but actually uh, they started working and now they have more than 1,500 uh, 1, uh, tigers living in India. That's why this is the, la the country which have the most amount of tigers around. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about food? I didn't talk about food. Do you know what type of food is eaten in India? I think that now Indian food is known all over the, the, the world. Do you know the name of a, a dish or of a kind of food that they eat? It, there is, it is one that is very popular. Guys, why don't you turn on your cameras? I can see Leo, I can see Hector, Linda is not there, but Hector is. <laughs> I can see Barbara, Cynthia, Darling. But what about you guys? I want to see you. Hello. Hello, hello, guys. Okay, so tell me about what you. food. Thank what you. Food. You're welcome. In general, in general, it's very spicy. You know? I, yes, you know that. You know what? That uh, actually, India is the country that has the most amount of spices, and that's why it it was it became a, a very wealthy country long time ago because uh, India sold the spices to other countries like uh, or continents like Europe or or other parts in Asia. So that's why people wanted to conquer India. They were very rich. Mm -hmm. So uh, what about food? There is a food that it is, uh, that it is very popular in India. Guys, uh, what about you? Selvin, Fatima, Jessica, turn on your cameras. I want to see you. Um, samosa is very food, very rich food. They are herbs. I, the name of the food I am I am talking about is curry. Have you ever heard about curry? Yes. Curry is a very popular food from India. And actually, when we think about curry, we think about one type of food, right? But actually, in India, there are more than 100 types of curry. Curry is only the name that the combination of spices uh, receives, but actually there could be different types of curry depending on the spices that you use to cook. 
So curry is one of the most popular food in India. Also vegetarian food. They usually don't use vegetables for that. Mm -hmm. Okay then, then Carlos, Elvin, Fatima, what's going on with your cameras guys? Turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see, Jancy, Juan, Jasmine, Catherine, Gabriela, come on guys, I wanna see your face. I have been speaking like for an hour telling you about India, but I want to know how do you feel about it? Are you sleeping? <laughs> Was it okay? Were you born? Tell me about it. <laughs> Oh. Sorry, okay. teacher. I am working. Ah, okay. Don't I worry. am working. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jazzy. Hi, teacher. Okay, perfect. So, uh, <coughs> I think that in general, the the Indian culture has been known because it is very colorful and expressive. We can see Indian people speaking, and we can see that they are always having a they, are, they always have like a good character. They, they never seem to be bad, mad. And uh, I think it's uh, because of the different uh, religions that they profess that they are like, uh, they have to connect their inner part with the external part. So if your interior is happy, your exterior is as well. It's a very interesting culture to learn about actually. So if you have the chance, to look for more information. There is a lot of information. It was very difficult for me to decide which information was most important to present. So I tried to bring probably some facts that you didn't know, like the fact of Bollywood or the fact of why English was spoken. But I think that there are more things that we can learn about this culture. And if you have the chance to do it, look for, look for written media. There are also um, some media on videos. Now videos can help you to learn about a lot of culture and uh, a lot of uh, videos in English. So you start practicing with them. That's a good idea. So guys, tell me, what do you think about this? What was your favorite part? about the the um, the different facts that i show you about india what did you like the most mm. for example what did you like the most what was your favorite part from the presentation my favorite part uh, teacher yes what uh, it was a uh, presentation uh, and a uh, history the temple the Taj Mahal mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, the, uh, the history of, of love and um, I, I like the activity in, in, in India there are different different uh, things uh, different interesting things um there are uh, culture there are um there are culture art music uh, uh, different things interest interest things thank you teacher. Mm -hmm. okay thank you thank you juan yes there are a lot of interesting things yes darling tell me okay um well i like india for their dance Oh. and music <laughs> they have a lot of a lot of rhythm and um, i like song and i have listened uh, to music about them and i really like it yeah it's nice it's, yeah it's really upbeat indian music is really upbeat so we it's normal that we feel happy when you listen to it i do it <laughs> i like it too uh -huh. carlos what about you what did you like from the presentation I have two Carlos, Carlos Fuentes and Carlos Joel, the two of you, tell me. Okay, <laughs> um, I like uh, the construction of Taj Mahal and ah. dancing, and dancing. And dancing as well. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, it's good. What about you, Carlos Fuentes? Well, uh, I'm very interested in the culture, uh, the buildings, the constructions, uh, I don't know the histories. Uh, I think uh, the most uh, construction is only Taj Mahal. I don't know if more construction very interesting. And I think uh, this, that, uh, I like it. 
Yeah, did you hear that more than 1,000 elephants were used to move all the marble? Marble means marmol. So they move all the marble with 1,000 elephants from different parts, different countries, not only from India. So from other parts of Asia, imagine that. I think about if in this, in this moment, it is difficult to build the buildings that we used to live, for example, imagine years before when there wasn't any technology. Without technology, how was it possible to, buy, to build those things? It's incredible. Amy, what did you like about the, the presentation? Um, I didn't know about the Bollywood and it surprised me because you said that they produce more movies than Hollywood. Yes, it's incredible. And you know that Bollywood, Bollywood uh, stars are in India more popular than Hollywood ones. <laughs> so if, if Brad Pitt visit, uh, if visits India, probably no one would know him. But if one, one uh, Bollywood stars goes out from home, they definitely would recognize. It's incredible how that in our countries, I think that now because of the internet and you know, some streaming like Netflix and Amazon Prime Video, you can see those movies, you can watch them and learn more about the different ways that they live because something important about their movies is that they include their cultural and uh, all the heritage that we have from their culture into the movies. So that is quite important. They are not making like uh, Hollywood action mm -hmm. movies, but they include their culture in each of the movies. So I think that's why it makes it different. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good. What about you, Nancy? What do you think? What's your favorite part? I really like the um, architecture part. Uh, and I I was um, impressed. Uh, I was impressed. Mm -hmm. I was impressed with the arts, and there are many arts in the that structure, and the colors that they use. Uh, almost the uh, um, gold color and golden. Yes, there are constructions. Uh huh. Yes, you know that for them, gold is not only like. Uh, gold is not like they use it because it is expensive no they use gold because for them a gold is the color of gods so when they put the golden color into every building and they put the pieces of gold on them it's like if they are attracting gods to them so they can live uh, wealthy if god is with me i can live wealthy if it is not i can't so they use those colors to attract the sight of god to them so it's it's very interesting okay you guys so it has been a, a long presentation i i i hope that you that you like it try to look for more information trust me there was a lot of information about india some information that i i couldn't use because uh, i would make the presentation extremely longer <laughs> so try to look for more try to look for more information try to learn more about different cultures it would help and um, it's also interesting to learn about accents accent is something that you will learn from different countries where english is spoken australia there is also the british english try to learn more about the different accents that would help you to learn more words maybe that can be used uh, globally. So try to learn for that. That's also important. And I think that was also an interesting part about uh, this, uh, this presentation about India. So I hope that you liked the trip. <laughs> so I hope that you join me the next time we travel. I don't know where are we going, but uh, you're welcome to come with me, okay? Okay, guys, so it's been a pleasure. I hope you have a nice weekend. Enjoy the rest of the of the day and rest a little, okay? So let me say namaste. Namaste to you guys. <laughs> Good teacher. Yeah. For all teacher. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, teacher. Bye, teacher. Thank you. Bye, teacher. Bye, teacher. Thank you. Bye. Bye, class nice. Bye, bye. Okay, thank you. Bye, teacher. You're welcome.